UFC 302 in Newark, New Jersey. Staph infection, pus leaking. Don't give a fuck if it's open or bleeding. Yeah. All up and down the card. Islam Makachev, Dustin Poirier potentially. We got Paulo Costa with a leaking wound. That's the it's, really bad one. Oh, dude, that thing is disgusting. Oh. So yeah. yeah, another staph infection filled card. Welcome to Cagecraft Podcast, boys, presented by Combat Sports today. How are we feeling? How that we was a good killer intro. intro that was Thank you. Sweet. That was sweet. I, co- I cooked that it. one up. I cooked that one up this afternoon. I was, we were talking about the staff infections, getting ready for the pod. Oh and I'm like, God. you know what? I got to do a little something with this. I did get to watch you practice it quietly. And, hey, you, know, the hey, you didn't, well you didn't see it. shit. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, uh, but uh, no, it, yeah, how you boys fights. doing, huh? I mean, it takes talent to fit to know which words to put to what music like when you you yeah. try to make a little parody song so yeah i mean fights are go. okay i mean i'm the biggest poirier fan but uh his ch- i mean he basically has a puncher's chance which you know was the best knockout artist in lightweight history so that's a good chance but against his makachev it's a very slim chance so and then the rest of the card's fine like I think the rest of the card's quite mid. I actually had a comment on Instagram where I said it was mid. And yeah, I mean, got a bunch of likes, but a bunch of people said you're a fucking casual, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, dude. for sure. I'm a casual for uh, not loving that there are like no ranked fights on this card. Yeah. Guy who <laughs> but, watches uh, thirty hours of regional MMA yeah. a week, you're a fucking casual. <laughs> exactly, but um, but yeah, I guess start off the top as we've been doing lately. Okay, I wanted to ask you guys beforehand what do you think you would rate this full card out of 10 knowing how we rate how we weight each section you know weight the main event the most co-main event the second most feature about third most main card fourth most prelims fifth most early prelims least i think it's gonna end up like a honestly around a seven just because i think the main and co-main are actually pretty good fights but as i said the rest of the card leaves a lot to be desired for me yeah, the rest of the cards still matter. I'm, in the... I'm saying mm-hmm. like a five and a half. Five and a half, okay. Very top heavy. Yeah, I'm going to say six and a half. Okay. It's a good spread. All right. Yeah. All right, so yeah, first fight, main event. Um, I mean, we all, I assume, agree Islam is the favorite. How heavy of a favorite, I guess? Like, how much of a chance do you think Dustin has? What chances? Man, it's... uh. It's tough to say because, I mean, obviously he, like you said, is a tremendous, one of the best knockout artists in history. He has a very advanced resume, obviously facing guys like Khabib, Islam's coach. But what gives me the biggest pause is the habits that he's shown even in fights with, you know, or with fighters such as Khabib or even Benoit Saint-Denis, who's not even the same level of fighter, but still a very dangerous grappler. Guys um, trying to grapple, yeah. Exactly. He, uh, Charles. Yeah, Sam Charles. Arabic. He just, he doesn't have good cage craft. There, I said it again. He just, hey. yeah. He walks himself back onto the cage a lot. And I think, you know, he's very comfortable with his ability to get up, his uh, wall walk, you know, the American top team classic technique. Um, mm. But the problem is, is like, again, he's so comfortable standing in front of guys and just striking that guys can work him back, work him back, work him back, and then he backs up against the cage. And he can get taken down and kind of, you know, that's where he's had the most issues in his career. Yeah. Um, and I mean, for all the memes and stuff, for Christ's sake, Dustin, do not try to guillotine Islam. I'm I actually really saw a does. stat. I forget. I think it was Al Zanino, if I'm not mistaken. If, that, if that's, if I'm getting his name right on Twitter, he tweeted this yeah, stat. Yeah, Zalino. Um, Zalino, there we go. Um, he was doing some digging on uh, statistics regarding um, submissions in the UFC. Over the last 10 years, guillotines have a 13% success rate yeah. in the UFC. So meaning and on attempt to guillotine. has dropped consistently. Yeah, exactly. This is the lowest the success rate's been except for like 2016. It was at 10%. So there's been a slight uptick, but probably it, just better usage and stuff. Sense. But it does. So again, it's like, don't be silly. Jump the ghillie. No, don't be silly. Get the fuck don't away from the guillotine, bro. Don't jump I mean, it. Dustin, because... He doesn't even like have a particularly great 
guillotine. Like he he's just, never hit he just, one, like, man. Arch- I know. I mean, he must hit it in the training room or something. Yeah, but he gotta. just he really like arches his back into it, and like he just goes for like full strength and not much finesse. I feel yeah, like well, he, with his guillotine, he doesn't crunch the way that you're supposed to, especially like you know when you're jump the guillotine if they've got half guard and whatever you want to crunch. So your lat and your armor is what's really doing the choking, mm-hmm. and he just arches. Yeah, and arching isn't like people. That's like a. It doesn't work. It, let, yeah. it gives them the opportunity to pop their head out. A he lot that's hunches. like the amateur. Mid- he hunches, not crunches, because he yeah puts the it up the upper back, well, he's uh, the yeah. lower back. Yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, again, it's but like yeah. you yeah. know damn well Islam's going to be ready to <laughs> defend his neck. Yeah, no problem. And again, yeah. you're, just get, you're giving him exactly what he wants in that situation. And again, I think Islam's going to be very comfortable striking. Um, very. But it's uh Southpaw. Oh, Southpaw. If I, I may just, raise I was just gonna say that too. point. Yeah, go ahead, Jesse. Can you imagine if Poye rocks him, Islam shoots and he jumps the gilly and actually lands it for the you know, all the marbles yeah, be crazy. for everything to I'll top be, off the career. I mean, I'll be drinking a whole bottle of hot sauce then. Don't do that to yourself, dude. I know it could be. I already said I'd do it if that. he wins by gilly, so you don't, also like another you don't have to. Like another man's life, you can just enjoy the fights, man. <laughs> you can delete the tweet, man. There's time. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm good. I want to do it. it sounds okay. fun. I think you're gonna do it regardless. No, I think it's not the only sauce he wants to slurp from I'll Dustin do, Poirier. I might you know do what I mean? Shot oh. Okay, there that wasn't sorry, even that I'm good. Sorry. That wasn't even that good compared to my Thunderdome. Like, oh, get out of here! Thunder I don't even know what you're like, talking okay. about. What are you talking okay. about, Thunderdome, bro? All right, we're getting off topic. Can we get on track here? Thunderdome. But again, I'm not saying this just because of the results of Gaethje versus Poirier, but Islam is a heavy kicker in, yeah. you know, in the standup at this point. And, you know, again, the open though, side. Southpaw versus Southpaw. Oh, yeah. Southpaw versus Southpaw. Yeah. Open side will not be available. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be fa- fascinating. I know Islam does like to use his lead hand a lot just as a wrestler to pull on the glove, you know, move, grab, collar ties, stuff like that. He's really yeah. good out of the clinch too. So Poirier, you know, if he tries to box up close, Islam's really good at grabbing the double collar tie and working from there. Very good. So at it. again, it's like Dustin Poirier is great. He deserves all the respect in the world, but it's just like you look at all the all the facts and the deck that's stacked against him, you get a little bit uh you can understand why Islam's a minus five hundred favorite. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. When- one other thing that I think bears mentioning is that, you know, against Orthodox fighters, Islam doesn't really go to his open space wrestling all that much. He just pressures guys back, enters in, goes for the wall wrestling. Against Southpaws, he almost always shoots for that lead leg right away, open space. If he can't get guys down right away, he walks into the cage where he does when, his best work. When you say against Southpaws, you mean against Drew Dober? Against Drew Dober and uh, Bobby Green, I believe. Bobby Green's a southpaw, mm, okay, he switches. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, one thing, you know, obviously I've been trying to uh, give myself hope all week. I'm, I'm rocking a Hawaiian shirt right now, I gotta. But, uh, <laughs> you know, Islam is definitely a lot less comfortable standing against southpaws, I believe. Especially just based on, like, watching those fights, the way he shoots right away the second he gets an opportunity. Yeah, I agree. Whereas with orthodox fighters, he's more comfortable you know, actually standing and striking with guys because he's got really good tools, actually. Like, that middle kick for him is really, really good. Yeah. Um, but I think there's a solid chance because Dustin Poirier, we saw his lead hook in full display against Benoit Saint-Denis. Mm-hmm. I think there's a really solid chance that as, uh, not Volkanovski, as Islam's throwing his left, Poirier can just turn it over. Yeah. Catch him on the entry. Or if he that tries would to be good for him, from but open stance can step in and bang him out through the down the center. One, yeah, but again, one, I think like, Poirier's big gonna... problem is just the footwork. Oh, sorry, yeah. you go. Oh no, I was just gonna say I think the big difference between the Sunni fight and Islam obviously is just the defensive awareness while entering in the pocket. And as a big yeah. DSD fan, I mean, I think we all identified that previous or before the fight. That's like, yeah, yeah his open side is going to be there. He's going to leave his hand down. And as much as Islam, it, he's gotten caught before in his one loss and he's, it, anybody can. It's just I feel like he's going to use his range weapons yeah, to push Dustin well, into a place where he can get close or just, you know, not even try to avoid well, his strongest weapon. It's going to be a left hook. Well, and one thing that um, 
Islam was doing right. against Drew Dober and other southpaws, he was leading with the rear uppercut, which if I'm in the corner of Poye, I'm saying, like, you know, try and draw that out. Like, give him little ducks to make him think that that opening's there and then try to catch that right hook on the entry because it's beautiful. That's a perfect shot. And that's, yeah. you know, going to have devastating a effect. Big but, motion if he's trying to throw that. Yeah, I really – I just don't see Dustin having all that much of a chance. You know, he – yeah. Backs himself straight up. He can't defend a, a shot to save his life, really. Give me a number. Percent chance. For percent Dublin. chance? 15. Done? Yeah. Sounds about right, to be honest. Okay. Yeah, about the same. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 an uphill battle. I mean, Dustin, he, I don't think he's like has bad awareness of the cage. I think it's just with his defensive, you know, grappling cage craft, wrestling cage craft. It's just that he knows the shot is coming. So, you know. It's just really hard to do anything when you know a shot's coming and the shot is that devastating. He's been out grappled only by like the best guys. Like literally, like you know, you can say, "Oh, the guy only lost the champs," but he only lost the champs who are like among the best of all time at this. <laughs> Charles and uh, Habib. So you know, yeah, if but he, he was Islam, having a it'll be tough another time. One. He was having a tough time with the grappling of Benoit. And I mean, I don't. Benny was? is not the most technical grappler. I mean, I I only think he was if he hadn't been John McGillies, he wouldn't have been in trouble with the grappling. I think, and I, I think he was just doing that because he was not as worried about him. I really don't think he'll be doing that against Islam. But oh well, god! Another thing about uh, Islam that I find interesting is, you know, his passing is phenomenal. His top game, his pressure is great, but he doesn't seem to wrist ride quite as well as Khabib did. So if, you know, if your Poirier, priority number one, if you could take it down, is just two-on-one, control the wrist, start building up. Mm-hmm. Um, because it's, he doesn't seem to have – oh, I'm sorry, you go. I'm not going to say you're wrong, but it is interesting because I did literally retweet a video like 30 minutes ago of a highlight reel of Islam wrist riding and controlling wrists from the back. Oh, no, that's, not, that's not to say he's, he's yeah. bad at all. I just think yeah. Khabib had like – because, you know, their entire approach is very different. Khabib was very like, aggressive. He would strike. And, he would hold the yeah. wrist, strike, and then advance. And yeah. Islam in, in doing is, that, doesn't in strike striking, as much on the ground. In striking, you're not giving them the chance to really work their yeah. defensive grappling. Like If you have to prioritize protecting your head or moving to get away from shots, you're not going to be able to start building as well. Um, whereas, like again, against Drew Dober, like... Islam is just holding on, body lock passing, just holding on. Dober's able to sneak a butterfly hook in and start elevating, yeah. grabbing a Kimura grip and getting his hips out. Like, Obviously, we know how that goes in the long run. You, Islam Makhachev has an incredible top game, incredible pressure, yeah. and he will suck the life out of you. And but he does not have agile hey, moves. Yo. Ah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, and the Poirier's hips just aren't capable, aren't really capable of doing that sort of thing, especially at this age. If he gets up, it's going to be wall walking or, you know, getting to the cage. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think he's clear- using butterfly hooks to get up, you know, at this stage. He might maybe no. get to do like a reversal, but he just, he's just not that quick. And especially his hips aren't that quick or that strong to do most of those things you just said. Um, so I, if he gets down, it's going to be bad in wall walking, uh, you know, unless he literally has his back to the cage and is able to stand from that, which is a, like a rarer form of wall walking. He's going to be giving his back up to get up. Islam, phenomenal backpacker, you know, right up there with Aljo as the best, Great knees the best as well. backpackers in the sport. Yeah, He'll throw um, knees from that referee's, standing referee's position as well to the head, to the body and you know, yeah. yeah, and then he'll, he'll go the short hook, long hook, flatten guys out the second they <laughs> yep. start trying to yeah. turn. To get to mount or um, to, you know, flatten out, he's coming up on top, and he does a lot of really good work from top half, side control, mount. You know, Dylan, that's where he gets most of his like striking offense off. Dylan, what you said earlier about the clinch and about uh, hand fighting, like Islam, Islam liking to hand fight, and then you know, pull, just mm-hmm. physically pull guys close and crack them down. Uh, Dustin eschews the hand fight entirely. He's like, I am just not going to hand fight with you. So yeah. that could be good, but it can also like it can also be a way to like just that the guy can just literally just walk in close to you, you know, unless you crack him mm-hmm. with a good punch. Um, but Dustin, well, again, he that's... has had trouble in the clinch with you know strong collar tie guys, uh, just because his guard is you know not well suited to clear it 
I mean, Gagey uh, hit him with forms. the classic reach out, grab your head, and punch your head while I'm grabbing it from behind. Yeah. Oh, and, and Charles, yeah. you know, Charles like, was all over him there, too. Yeah. Um, yeah, Islam not as damaging from there, but definitely dangerous and, you know, arguably more dangerous because it can lead to a takedown. So. And again, one of my favorite little techniques that Islam does, just probably before we move on from this fight, is when he's in the clinch, particularly up against the cage, he'll throw a knee to the body. Yep to bait the knee back from the other from his yeah, opponent and then reach down and catch the knee single leg take him to the mat just, so it's just yeah, sweep out the foot yeah or the foot you know I it's love like that it's so One nice because he it's just creating expected offense from your opponent that you can then create more yeah um opportunity off of and it's i mean i use it in muay thai even just like sweeps off that you know i always yeah, you know you my know coach talks about knee. it throw knees they're gonna knee you back catch that knee take him to the ground, you know, so and same with kicks. Yeah. You know, it, mm-hmm. it exactly. always or almost always works. You kick yeah. somebody really fucking hard. They're going to be like, Hey man, I want to kick you back. And then so you're ready. You can do it. So, all right. To close out conditions for victory for, do- I mean, Islam, we know grapple or, I mean, he could keep it striking and win minutes on the feet. But you know, I think even if he wants to test himself on the feet a little bit against Dustin he, at the end, he's going to grapple, you know, Maybe not the first round, but by the second round, if he doesn't shoot a single takedown, I'll be really surprised unless he somehow is dominating on the feet, which I'll be even more surprised if that happens. Yeah. Um, Dustin, keep the range. You know, he's not going to be defending every Islam takedown. Like, it's just not possible. Islam will have really good success if he could actually get to his takedowns. Uh, Circle out. Play the yeah. foot battle. Really, really good defensive uh cage craft you know single shots not getting stuck in on combinations because you know you can't stay in, he just can't stay in the pocket too long with islam at all and don't do the shift don't yeah. do the poye shift you're giving him your hips and you're opening up all of his best weapons i mean if all of his open side weapons i can see circumstances where it would work like if he already kind of has islam moving back and he wants to cover a lot of ground quickly um, like, because Islam sometimes does move back in straight lines when he shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, especially but if they're close MMA enough to the cage whole. that it can, Everyone like... Everyone does. Yeah. But if they can, like, he, if he's close enough to the cage that it can back Islam right onto the cage and just set him up to get hit, that would be good. Um, but, yeah. yeah Islam I mean, has it, been known to panic. Chance. Not panic, but, like, if he's getting worked back, worked back, he'll just shoot yeah. on the hips, too, if he feels like he's getting yeah. pressured yeah. too hard back. That's... And I doubt Dustin's going to, like, pancake him in that situation and end up on top. You know, it's like... Yeah, at the very least, that can interrupt the flurries. There's just that's, that's the problem, like you said. There's so many more paths to victory for Islam than there are for yeah, Dustin here. It's like everything Dustin can do, other than knock him out cold, Islam can counter with just out wrestling him. And yeah, um, yeah, no, exactly what you're saying. Islam does sometimes get scared. Like he's clearly not comfortable in longer exchanges, mm-hmm. but in but he literally could, can probably just reach for Dustin's hips and, and take him down because Dustin's hips are not good. Like, if he gets to them whatsoever, Dustin's probably going to get taken down. Yeah, and as Jesse said, if he senses that shift coming, it's just, like, level change. Yeah. 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 Where, you know, it's like, yeah, so. Yeah. If he has I don't know, some, good. Yeah. yeah. Good fight, though. Oh, I mean, I'm excited for it. <clears throat> yeah, but, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm resigned for it because I know, like, Dustin's not going to win. Like, I know it. And uh, I'm not letting anyone get my hopes up or, you know, make jokes about gillies around me not <laughs> happening. And uh, I'm not letting you trick me into thinking it, it is going to happen because it's not. Love Dustin, it's not but it's impossible. not happening. It's not impossible, but it's not happening. It's just highly unlikely. Yeah. Well, so I'll, trust I'll give this a Poirier seven. Fan. You were spot on with uh, BSD versus him. So I, I trust that you'll be spot on again, just in a much sadder mm-hmm. manner. Um, <laughs> sadder I'll manner. go in. I'll go eight out of 10 just because, you know, these are two really, really high level guys and a great matchup. And the opportunity that Dustin has here is huge. It's just, it's just very tough. So yeah, man, eight it, out would of be, 10, I mean, going, it would be legendary. Beating it would pound be for pound number one, avenging the Habib loss. Like, yeah. oh man, but, it would um, be legendary, but it's not like I will. Uh, so would you say eight, eight out of 10? I'm going to go Islam by uh third round submission. That's where the last two title submission losses have been. So. I'll go seven just because while it is a very good fight, it doesn't, it just doesn't feel super competitive to me. Yeah. And that's not to discount Dustin or anything he's done in his career. It's just, you know, in terms of matchup, this is a really bad guy for him. He did not look great last time out, even if it was a definitive finish. And, you know, he's up there in age. It's, it's just not, you know, it could be one of the, 
Yeah, definitely mileage. It could be one of the greatest moments in the sports history if he does somehow do it. But, you know, in that vein, it's just not doing it for me. But we'll see Saturday. Yeah. Yeah, same here. But moving on, co-main event, Sean Strickland versus Paolo Costa. Lots of jokes flying around. I haven't watched the press conference. I hope it was suitably um, eh. cringe. I don't know what's the it word. Was... Lots of lots of staff lying around too. Yeah. Yeah. They were kind of just like sucking each other off, being like, oh, this guy's oh, fucking hilarious. This guy hates liberals. We're going we're gonna to bleed guy hates for you guys. Liberals. Oh, yeah, yeah this like, guy hates liberals. It's a great Sean Strickland impression. <laughs> oh, thank you. I hate it. Well, that's yeah, literally, I, that's literally what they're saying you, on Twitter. That's literally oh, what I saw on Twitter is them being like, I don't really like you, but you don't like liberals, or you're not a liberal, <laughs> or whatever, so yeah. you're good by but then me. also, Strickland was like, oh, I like Costa, you know, like, we all like Costa around here, right, guys? That's, you know. That's good. That's thank good. You. Dude, that's good. Thank you. I, uh, but yeah, I'm just going to read out this, uh, this meme real quick that Paulo Costa quoted, quoted no, the other day in the, the, oh my God. the Chad there's Costa and version uh, Strickland. Expl- there's a lot of expletives that we cannot say on here on there. Oh no, it's okay. There's not many. Uh, <laughs> not many. Virgin, Virgin Strickland won't say the N word, but is racist, bald, derogatory, jab merchant, <laughs> points guns at children and homeless, undeserves title shot and clowns fighters for crying than cries on podcast. And then underneath the Chad Costa section, openly says the N-word on Twitter, full head of luscious locks, overhand right enjoyer, <laughs> makes memes, misses weight and doesn't give a fuck, and openly on PEDs and the UFC does nothing. So that's <laughs> yeah, the last that about one. sums up the matchup for me. You, you know, jab merchant versus overhand right enjoyer. That's like, that's about it. For me, it's the it's the hypocrisy. At least Paolo's consistent, kind of, in his insanity. It's the... The hypocrisy things that that's pointed out in that memes that are really prescient. Oh, trust me, I it's it's a joke and it's a meme. I don't agree with anything and I don't like Sean Strickland. <laughs> so, um, yeah. but yeah, honestly, I think what this comes down to is Strickland's forward pressure and his jab and his ability to keep Costa off rhythm and on the back foot. Um, I mentioned to somebody earlier this week. I think the number one factor in this fight is going to be. Strickland's little uh, teat kick to the body on uh, Costa because it's going to sap his energy. And on those forward advances, when he's trying to throw big strikes, big kicks, overhands, that little kick can interrupt it a lot. Yeah. And yeah. for Strickland, it's, it's Same like with the jab. Same with the yeah, jab. Exactly. Same with jab. Um, and for Strickland, it's like, don't get caught. Um, yeah. He has the propensity to get knocked out. I think it's just so funny that he's like, we're going we're gonna to bleed for you guys. And then he's going to go out there and throw 150 jabs, about 20 right hands while playing the safest defensive guard you can, essentially, <laughs> to his head. Yeah. And reaching so, for everything that comes near him. And reaching for everything. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, uh, I think this fight has potential. It's also five rounds, which is interesting. Um, yeah, that's why I'm confident. That favors Strickland a lot. The five yeah. rounds. You said the teep kicks. I think the most, the biggest factor is going to be Costa's gas tank, which, unless it's you know really bloomed, unless he's on a shitload of EPO or something, um, you know his gas tank isn't as bad as people like to say it is. But I, it's not really like five rounds at a hard pace. So Strickland just turn the pace up. Costa will be dangerous for the first three, but Strickland should run away with it in four and five. I mean, um, again, and it I don't might think even be like... better striker for, through three. I see yeah, some I mean, disagreement again... maybe from Jesse though. I have a different read on this one, if we're being honest. Let's hear it. Well, first, you know, Polo Costa's gas tank is not as bad as a lot of people make it no, out to be. No, it's not bad, like, it but lo- it's not... Like, looking at him, it should be a lot worse than it is. He went five pretty hard rounds with Vittori. Yeah, but he lost high in clip. that fight because of his gas tank. He, he couldn't he keep up He did gas lead. towards the end. But, like, he can go five rounds. He just can't keep up with someone who can go five rounds at a hard pace. Strickland. But, well, his style. Here's the thing. It's just everything's such high effort from Paulo. He doesn't do. Yeah. It's very rigid. He, yeah. And he, he throws fucking hard. Um, I've heard people say he doesn't have like traditional, like explosive power. Like people, other fighters have, he has blunt force power. Yeah. He's yeah. Like, when he hits you, it's like a thud. Like it's a club. It's, That's it's a, a club. Example. Exactly. I always give for that the difference between whipping power and thudding power. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's he hits hard as shit, but and, it's not like, you know, somebody who's going to... Yeah. All right. Yeah. On the topic of uh, the teep from Strickland, 
he's only really used it against Adesanya well. He was scoring really well with it in the first, like, round and a half against Drickus, and then just abandoned it entirely. Huh. And in terms of rhythm, Strickland is a very one-note kind of guy, like a yeah. very one-tempo fighter. And, you know, the only times we've really seen Costa get hurt is when he doesn't see shots coming, is when it's not something that's, like, on a traditional line, on a traditional rhythm, and Sean Strickland is very predictable in what he'll yeah. do. It's literally just jabs, never a right hand, or never, like, a right hand that's going to do anything. Just a lot of jabs, straight lines, and I think Costa actually has a pretty good shot of, like, being able to come over the top with the right hand, dig the body on the inside. And for me, the matchup comes down to who's going to be the one in the center, who's going to be the one pushing. Because Costa is like as well. a phenomenally attritive guy. Yeah. Like he can really build his offense well. Take lumps out of you with body shots. Whereas Strickland is a guy who's really not going to put all that much damage on you, but he's going to kind of take you out of the fight entirely just by – not giving you room I mean, to do anything. He's attritive, just much slower, and he's just entirely attritive. He doesn't have a second thing yeah. to like build the attrition no, on. It doesn't to. build to anything. Yeah, it's exactly. Just, <laughs> like it just wins rounds, yeah, and exactly. it keeps the other guy from really doing much of anything. So to me, it's both guys don't have great footwork. One guy's a little bit more athletic than the other, yeah. and you know neither guy is really afraid to take the center and try to implement yeah. their A game because they neither has a B game, really. I, I think Costa may get a car crash to start, and he has a good chance of winning minutes, especially in those first three rounds. I mean, that's what I said. Like, it, I, He's dangerous in the first three rounds. I might even give him an advantage in a three-round fight. But, you know, will he be able to put Strickland out? You know, there will be a lot of times he's getting frustrated and not really able to land because Strickland's defense is annoying. Like, that's oh, it's the best leaning. I can, yeah, it, but I mean, just the way he uses his hands, his guard, and everything—it's just—it seems like uh, it seems just annoying to spar to fight against. Um, I mean, it is sparring. That was a, yeah. a great Freudian slip. <laughs> yeah, but um, but Paulo, like going around, you can get there. Like uh, Aspahera just got the timing, got the timing, got the timing, baited it, and went right around it because Strickland's hands are all right here. If you can really reach reach around. No, don't don't say anything. And, <laughs> Damn it! And, uh, and and hit him. You can clock him in the chin. But does we're just talking about it? The thudding power is Paul's power enough to really put Strickland out? Like Strickland has a good chin, not a great chin, like not a max or any Dustin tier chin, but he has a good chin. No, he's um, durable. He recovers yeah. well. Yeah, exactly. So that's in the end. That's why I have to pick Strickland. Uh, it comes down to cardio, and just I don't know if Paulo can do enough in those first three rounds to win the fight. And I don't know if he can be there enough in four and five when he really slows down, has to only have a couple of bursts per round. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He's going to fight in bursts. He's going to go. He's going to like where Strickland is 1.0, like one X rhythm all the time. One, one over one. Paulo goes from like 0.3 to like 3.3. You know, he'll be like doing not very much and then explode and then do not very much and then explode. He's not as like crazy with the variations of someone like you all Romero because he'll still put out consistent offense in the middle. Um, but you no, know, it's those explosions where he's really looking to hurt his opponent. And if he can hurt Strickland enough times per round, maybe he can, maybe he can even win the first three rounds on the scorecards. Um, but it'll be hard and he will have to do damage. He'll have to separate. Um, and Strickland will always give him a chance to separate just because Strickland's not going to pull away with the rounds himself. Um, that's one of the things about Sean Strickland. He rarely completely pulls away with rounds. He has these close split decisions. At least people who haven't just watched his last couple of fights know this. Um, you know, that's most of his apex career is close split decisions. Uh, that that shouldn't suck. be that close. Yeah. His finish be... over Abus is just the funnier. Yeah. So funny the longer time goes on. Yeah. <laughs> I mean. But, um, Aging like milk. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah. Strickland by decision for me. But that's. You know, I've given my reasons on why I think Paul has a chance, and uh, if he can clock Strickland a couple good times, it might be enough to change the course of the fight. Yeah, um, I I feel like Strickland might win, but I'm gonna ride with my boy Costa as well. Maybe okay. he can get some poison damage off by kicking him with the staff foot. <laughs> um, but uh, 
God, yeah, I think uh, there's a hole in his foot. Okay, so yeah. it's, all, it's oh, gross. What's your rating? Let's hope Mine this is... fight happens. Mine might be an eight because it's. Competitive. I'm gonna go an eight. It's one of the better middleweight fights you can make right now, and just for the meme factor yeah. of both of them. I yeah. also would like to share a little fact. I can now share this because this fight's happening. Paulo Costa had not signed the contract up until two weeks ago, and I, I get this from pretty reputable sources. And That's they what? were on they were on the verge of moving Jared Cannonier from the main event of UFC Louisville next weekend oh. to fight Sean Strickland for the second time instead of Paulo Costa. Know. And it they called they called Paulo Costa and was like, We're about to call Jared Cannonier and have him sub for this fight. And Paul was like, I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. Okay, here's the signature. He actually tweeted a, a couple weeks ago, like a picture of him just writing in like, you know, on his screen essentially, like on yeah. the UFC logo. See, is this good enough? Like contract signed. <laughs> and everybody thought he was just fucking around, but legitimately he almost got replaced by Jared Cannonier for this fight, <laughs> which is crazy. So, okay. Um, anyways, my, so uh, and Jesse last note on it is, you know, one thing Strickland does a lot. That's really not good is the reaching for everything, especially like what came back to bite him against Pajeda besides, you know, his entire approach and fighting a guy that was going to knock <laughs> him the hell out. But the reaching, and Costa has a pretty decent switch kick to the body. He hits the body well. If you can get him reaching and swiping for everything and come up with that big overhand or whatever, you can conceivably steal rounds, if not, like, you know, genuinely hurt him. Um, I'm mm-hmm. going to go Costa by decision. Part of that is fueled by my hatred for Sean Strickland and everything about him from the fight style yeah, to, I you know, the personality. Happens. But yeah, dude, I'll go eight out of ten. It's got potential. Oh, right. Sounds good. Moving on down, we've got a pretty interesting fight between a couple of guys who are uh, pretty cool but very flawed, and I think we're all pretty good fans of yeah. Kevin Holland and Mihal Olakchechik, our well, boy. Yeah, I'm frustrated with Kevin because he could be better, but if he's going to stay at this level forever, at least he'll be fun. Well, here's my problem with this fight, Kevin Holland. Dropped down to welterweight, was good there for a while, and then loses, gets bummed, moves back up to middleweight to fight arguably the most undersized middleweight in the division. <laughs> and arguably the coolest middleweight That's in the true. division. We love Mihal. Or at least in the top five. He's not in, oh, in the top five coolest. Top five coolest, yeah. Not <laughs> I was like, top top five five not in the top division. five. Not in the top not five. Yet. It's then, coming, baby. Okay. Mihal but, title challenger 2025, seven, maybe? Yeah, but <laughs> twenty thirty two. <laughs> but Jesse, yeah, technically. What do you think? I think it's going to be an interesting fight. It's not going to. I don't think it has all that much in terms of like depth of technical skill because Oleg Jacek, while he is a very fun, interesting guy, he does one thing. Um, he does one thing, and I really like that thing. And I will admit, I do have this problem where when a guy does one thing really well or one thing that I really like, I tend to overrate the rest of their game. <laughs> Just sort of yeah. like blankly assuming like, yeah, it's probably on par with that. Uh, with Oleg Jacek, I can confidently say it's not. And Kevin Holland is very much the same way. He's a guy who's not, again, all that, you know, deep in terms of skill level. He's fun. He's long. Um, he does cool stuff. He loves that little elbow. Um, he likes slapping guys sometimes. He likes to talk a lot. But, you know. Yeah. I mean uh, – it's pretty much, in my opinion, like a, a rebound setup for Holland. Yeah. Um, but Michal could do his thing and start ripping to the body and setting he things could. up. I just don't know how likely it is. Yeah, I mean, with Kevin Holland's iron chin and durability in general, it's going to be hard to really make him fall. Like, you can win by decision, but without wrestling, it's hard to finish – or grappling, like, it's hard to finish him. I think Kevin, you know, someone who approaches him with a boxing game – who's this like this much shorter than him in terms of reach and everything, it's going to play right into what he wants. Like it could look like the Buckley fight, an aggressive guy coming forward and Kevin just able to snipe them from, you know, uh, seven inches away. Cause that's the reach advantage. He has more like 10 inches. Cause he has a three inch height advantage also. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be like that. Maybe Kevin, I, I honestly, I really think like Kevin's going to like beat looks check up pretty bad when it looks like is being the aggressor. Uh, and then, like, make him, like, get hurt and grab a single leg or just fall in the second round, and Kevin just darces him. 
So I'm yeah, going Kevin Madars. Seven out of ten. It's it's fun. I think yeah, but I think Kevin should like be like eighty percent here to win this. Yeah, I'm gonna go five out of ten because I think this is dumbass matchmaking. And again, I don't like putting. I mean, I guess if you're gonna put one night one no fighters, you might as well put them together. Um, yeah. But yeah, I uh, I'd like Ami Hall to win. I like his overhand to the head and body and the way he mixes it up. I know that's what Jesse likes too. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't see much of a path for victory here, and it feels very much set up matchmaking. And a guy that I don't yeah. like to be set up. Because I like Mihal. That's why I don't like this fight. So Yeah. <laughs> I, I will say Holland does do a decent amount of backing himself up to the fence when guys yeah. are even kind of trying to pressure him. Like it doesn't have to be the most intelligent pressure and yeah. he'll back up a little bit. And his defense and, is just dumb as shit, no matter yeah. how you look at it. <laughs> and with Oleg Shakespeare's ability to just kind of cut a little angle and start banging, I'm not saying it's a high likelihood probability, but uh I would like to see it, um, but yeah, no. Holland, I'm, I'm saying by finish, um, but I'll go 7 out of 10 on it. I like it. It's okay. a good enough fight. Two guys that swang. Swang. Yeah, we like swanging. Um, okay. You like swanging, dig? Hey. <laughs> I, um, Boo. Your dad Sorry. was slanging dick to me. That means you were okay. getting... F- okay. Let's, let's <laughs> yeah, it does, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, that didn't happen, guys, right? Ha ha. All uh-huh. right. Next, a guy who used to like swanging and banging and throwing stangs Wait, around this and getting knockouts from the bottom. Right here? No, no they moved know. It. it got moved. Nico, I know. I'm, yeah. I'm happy Nico about Price, that. Nico uh, Price used to be crazy. Now is like a shell of his former self, I think. Um, no durability and not athletic enough to even like fight like crazy. Like he actually is kind of boring now to watch uh, against Alex Morono, who is fun to watch because he is not athletic at all, but actually has like a really good process. And, uh, you know, he has no like pop on his shots, but he has really good technical striking skills. Um, pretty good grappler too. interesting front chokes. Yeah. Yeah, we I, just saw him fight. That was really recently. Yeah. April 6th. Yeah, he fought. Yeah, wow, wow. Let, yeah, Court McGee. Two months ago. Uh, he, he's been well, pretty busy. I mean, two fights a year the last couple of years. Four fights, in, three fights in 2021. So He's game, man. Yeah, he's always I willing mean, to step up and yeah, take a is. fight, which I like. He, he literally fights whoever. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I like Moreno. 13-6 and six in the UFC. One of the best records of someone who's not ranked or anything. Um, but he's just lost every time he steps really up. To ranked level like Buckley, Ponzinibbio, Pettis, Cass Williams knocked him out. Um, anyway, well, again, I think the consistency you see throughout all those opponents is the athletic disparity there. Yeah, and yeah. this is not a fight where I think he's going to be suffering from that much because, like you mentioned, no, maybe exactly Nico Price from four or five years ago would be a very big problem for Morono. But at this point, I think well, Morono is going to be able to kind of do what he wants. Actually, fun fact, Nico Price from four or five years ago actually was a really big problem for Alex Morono. He finished him no oh my god, because he tested positive for marijuana. That's, mm-hmm. That was that fight. Oh, my God. Yeah, that, I totally yeah, forgot about that. was seven years that. ago. So, wow. Yeah, yeah, seven years ago. But, it's not, it's, you yeah, know, to, fuck, to the man. Point, to the point is, like, that's back when Nico Price was a lot more athletic Whereas I Alex Morono didn't Alex realize was a lot worse. they fought each other, man. Yeah, Alex Morono's improved well, a lot. Like he's a real yeah, student we'll in the game. Back Morono. then, he was losing to Jordan Mine, Hita Nakamura, <laughs> and he's never had to really worry about fading athleticism. He's never no, been he's the more athletic. athletic, like the most athletic guy. So he's yeah, always he just been just... able to kind of develop his game around his physical limitations. And a guy like Nico Price hasn't. He he's mm-hmm. been a front runner based on athleticism and power, and now. You know, that's largely gone. So I'm, I'm yeah. going Morono uh, wide decision. <laughs> I'm going to go six out of ten. I like Morono. Yeah. I'm always enjoy, I always enjoy watching him work, like, genuinely. He does. He always does some cool, you know, intelligent things in the cage. Absolutely. I'm going Morono decision. But Nico's I'm going Morono is gone, sub, so it's possible. By the way. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing Nico tries to wrestle now, too, in, like, like his Alex Oliveira fight. Horrific fight. And you want to talk about a guy who can jump guillotines really, really, really well. Yeah. That's Alex Morono. He like one of the means... few guys and... I'd feel comfortable like, yeah, jump that. Well, gu- at this level, bro. yeah, he can jump it. Yeah. And Nico Price is not a very good grappler. Like, he's no. not terrible by any means. He's not bad. 
but it's been okay off his back he in the would past, just, but yeah. Because yeah. yeah, he would grab he can the survive. weird positions and then be athletic to either stand up or knock someone out. He knocked out two opponents from the bottom, so. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, and those were insane. And one of those is fighting next. Yes. Look at that. Rude boy, Randy Brown. Yeah, so we got um, Rude Boy, Randy Brown versus Eliezer Zaleski Dos Santos, my favorite name in yeah, probably Brazil. It's so fun to say. So cool. Dos Santos, one of my um, fire. Uh, he is interesting. He has not been super active, but he's coming off what should have been, I think, a win. I mean, it was the scorecards were correct, but like he beat Renat Fakhradinov in that fight. Because, I mean, he 10 aided him in the third round after dropping him with that front body kick. Do you guys remember that? And then just pounded on him for like the next two minutes on the ground. And, uh, and I just hey. want to say, I've never oh. felt more validated because yeah. from the minute Renat became a thing, I was like, oh, this dude kind of sucks. Like, he's not yeah. good. Yeah. And then he did that to Kevin Lee, and everybody was like, oh, Kevin Lee. Like, oh, my it was God. Like... The ghost of Kevin Lee with no knees. <laughs> yeah, that was rough. But, um, I mean, I think he's but good yeah. in that. He's like top 20 to 25 type welterweight. So good, like like just outside of the rank, but like not like contender type good is yeah. my read on it. So his, his hype definitely outstripped his actual capabilities. Yeah, but we're talking about Dos Santos here. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Is that, no, you're good. Um, He's interesting because he actually has a Capoeira background, if I'm not mistaken. He's one of the few guys who like yeah, his, actually did his Capoeira for a while. Capoeira. Yeah. yeah, that's mm-hmm. that's fair. But and that um, would be to... very funny if he didn't have a Capoeira <laughs> background and just said that to throw people off. Well, there's another there's another Brazilian fighter I know of who's regional, and his nickname's literally BJJ. That's just <laughs> well, the nickname. Have, I'm like, okay, have... dude, very cool. <laughs> that rules. Sick. Neto BJJ. <laughs> yeah, that, at least that's like his gym, you know. But just like, yeah, just BJJ is a general sense. Like, okay, very oh, cool. that rules. But, but um, yeah, but yeah, Dos Santos, he's got good kicks. He'll kick from a variety of angles. He's very strong and powerful for the division. Um, yeah, I mean, just a thick-shouldered guy. Uh, he can grapple well. He's a good, good jujitsu artist. Um, again, I think it's uh inactivity has been his biggest uh yeah. downfall i think he i mean he was ranked there for a little bit if i'm not mistaken just at like around 15 yeah. and then dropped out because other guys were moving in and out but um yeah against randy brown i think this is a interesting fight he's coming Sorry. off the win over salikov yeah. starched him i mean he's obviously salikov's old so yeah can't take too much from that but randy brown's i mean he's like the definition of a long man's striker he's gonna throw very long one twos he's gonna throw long kicks He's going to try to use his length and reach to evade and move around the cage. He doesn't move around smart a lot of the time. Yeah. No. Uh, he's he's and like he's Bobby very, Green in a lot yeah, of ways. Yeah, he's very much like Bobby Green. He, he, he's, he fights he's with the love slow child. and swag. He doesn't actually like put that much onto his shots because he's trying to be cool. Um, and he's But he's, like, he's worse than Bobby Green because he doesn't press his advantages. He like takes pictures a lot, punches and them, he's looks, just he's like, ooh, instead well, Bobby of Green really going Bobby Green's unorthodox enough to really yeah. confuse guys and do weird shit. Yeah. But Randy Brown's just small enough. Fast. Yeah. It's because he's doing yeah. a lot. Randy, yeah. like, Randy Brown is doing a couple of weird things, slightly weird things, and just, like, a bunch of normal MMA stuff. Mm-hmm. And it's like, there's just not enough here to actually confuse someone. You need to do some weird, funky stuff, get to weird angles, and then, like, really put it on them. Yeah, uh, or do, just yeah, I do would more. Say like Randy Brown is just frustrating to watch. Randy Brown is the love child of Jalen Turner and Bobby Green. That's yeah. He's got good. the length and like the conventional, you know, offense and you know some of the weird stuff of Bobby. But I mean, the one thing That's about Randy Brown comparison. is he's so good at fighting long. Like he is. Yeah, he is. Uh, really quickly. Randy he's Brown's genuinely... a guy that I've known from the regional scene and been like very familiar with going back to like 2016, 2015. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, never has he had good footwork or been able to check leg kicks at all. <laughs> and he's, he's actually a pretty talented grappler. Like he's not bad yeah. by any means. Um, he's very much an opportunist, uh, type, Guard player and offensive grappler. That's how he's top been player. in MMA, also, yeah. But like, um, he does have he has solid boxing fundamentals, and those have troubled Eliza Zaleski dos Santos in the past. Yeah, but he has a lot the, of good skills in a lot of yeah, areas. No, I that's like why I'm frustrated with him. Like yeah. that's why I don't like him because he doesn't put it together well enough. He doesn't punish people with his athleticism enough. Like if you want to 
be famous as like being the, looking cool when you fight and knock some people out. Like, go for it. Don't have split decisions and decisions over Trinaldo, Chaos Williams, Jared Gooden. Knock these dudes out. Knock out Wellington Terman. Um, you know, he has these great finishes. The, the straight right over Salkov, but that's an old guy. He one arm rear naked choked Alex Oliveira. That was in 2021, but that was his last finish before that. Yeah, that was a like sick finish, though. It was, exactly. And then before that, he had a triangle choke against Warley Alves. Then he had that Brian Barbarena knockout. Um, he he has his moments, but now when he got to like the best point of his career, which was like 2021 to 2022, won four fights in a row, um, and even the fight he lost was against a top, top guy. Now he's won two more fights. He's just not taking advantage enough because – I think he just takes pictures too much. He doesn't do enough in there to press his advantages. Well, the thing is about um, Dos Santos is he's tough as shit and he's going to be there yeah. all three rounds. Yeah. I don't think he's going to get subbed by Randy Brown because he's no, too smart not. on the ground and he's just a good enough jujitsu practitioner himself to be able to handle, yeah. I think, anything Randy. And again, he's solid. Possible, he's strong. But, yeah. I, I just don't see it. It's possible. Yeah. I don't see it happening. Me, me either. And again, like, you know, he's gotten hurt in the past, you know, and like Randy Brown could hurt him, but I just don't see like him getting knocked out by Randy Brown necessarily. So, you know, if Randy can stay on the outside force, um, Dos Santos to kind of chase him and not really be able to get offense off and just, you know, force him to be slow. Like he kind of, not kind of sometimes is just in terms of pushing his offense. And then for Dos Santos, utilize your kicks, you know, get it, yeah. you know, be there, use your cardio force Randy Brown into corners, you know, cut the cage well. And I think if he does those things, it should be a pretty straightforward win just based on the skill sets. Yeah. One thing is, you know, of late as Zaleski Dos Santos is aging and kind of falling off just a little bit in terms of athleticism, mm -hmm. he's been getting a lot of his best work off in the clinch. Yeah. And against a guy as long and, you know, adept in the clinch himself as Randy Brown, I don't know – how realistic that path to victory is there for him or just to, you know, mix things up, get in and, and, you know, get damage off. And for that reason, I'm going Randy Brown by decision. I just think, you know, being so good at fighting long against a guy with questionable boxing fundamentals who is, you know, just a little bit towards the end, I think, like definitely on the back nine of the career. Um, but again, like, the calf kicks are there all day. They could pay massive dividends, but I don't know how much faith I have in Elias Zaleski Dos Santos. As Fair a yeah. huge fan of the dude, I love him. He rules. You're the He's biggest really fan of him, it turns out. <laughs> Spinning hook kicked Sean Strickland into oblivion. Mm -hmm. How can you not love him? Um, beat the crap yeah. out of Benoit Saint-Denis. Well, you don't and have his... to love that, necessarily. <laughs> I mean, hey, he's picking on a 155er there, let's be real. <laughs> yeah he's a jerk um, he's a bully yeah bully <laughs> but um his fight's fine i think it's what, this is not a main card fight yeah. to me but what are your rankings not for a pay-per-view no what are your rankings <sighs> this is a fight night main card fight yeah. yeah no that's a fair read i would go six on it i'll go yeah. five i got I'll go six. santos by decision i think it's i think it's above average dick. it's a fun enough fight i think i think though we'll be leaving or like after watching it you'll be like oh that fight could have been really good like, yeah, actually, it, it just didn't have enough. It just wasn't a high enough pace fight. Um, they both kind of stood around a little too much. Um, I think it's going to be like a split decision type fight. Uh, yeah, very much could be. Prime Zaleski, I would have picked probably. But right now, he's 37, man. Um, yeah, I think Randy's length is going to be a lot to deal with. Like, he's at, with the length, he can overcome the kicking uh, advantage that, that EZDS has. Like, just with his hands because he can probably reach with his hands as far as Zaleski can kick really so yeah and if Zaleski's kicking naked he can just time yeah, him well exactly. and deter that's what he, him that's from what kicking he's good in the future at. he's good at setting tra a trap and landing it and then just not either not putting enough on it not capitalizing on it whatever not finding the finishes he should be finding with his skill set all right, um, yeah, so six. Real quick intermission, Sorry. Helena Cravar yeah. just heel-hooked a girl in like 35 seconds at karate combat. Whoa. The most well, insane. I mean, yeah. Are these the grappling ones? Well, are they there give a couple her girls UFC that fighters very grappling? good. Yeah, but she's also sick, like 17, which is just insane. Yeah. But yeah, they got Jordan Levitt up next, I believe, which is kind of cool. Oh, yeah, yeah Jordan Levitt. And, uh, but it's just grappling, right? Is it AJ yeah. Aga's arm? Or is that is no, the other guy? That's... AJ was against someone else. Jordan okay. Levitt was facing uh, Ethan Krellenstein, I think. Oh, that's which is... right. That's right. That is cool. Dude, Jordan Levitt might get his ACL fucking destroyed. <laughs> By who? 
Ethan Krellenstein, he's a new wave guy, super legit, very uh, juicy. Big uh, pussy because he hunts for legs a lot. Agazar yeah, Murray, I, I hate went, leg lockers. Right? Oh, Marcus Perez was also on here. We're Who Van is uh, Morris, a- a- Jenkins, AJ. Charlie Ontiveros. Wait, is oh, Marcus Perez striking? Existed. Sorry that we're interrupting on this right now. Yeah, that that's in karate. Let's go. So is Ontiveros versus Jenkins, which that's actually a pretty fun fight. Ontiveros Jenkins, fun like regional slot fight. I'm just saying Jordan Levitt versus right uh, Ethan Krellenstein in karate would be much more appealing to me because yeah. those dudes <laughs> Who is... don't know karate. <laughs> okay, yeah, true. Okay. Okay. All right, let's get let's, back to it. Let's tear through this. All right, this might be the fight I'm most excited for, at least from an action perspective. Roman Kapilov versus Cesar Almeida uh, opening up the main card, I believe. Oh, no, the featured prelim, right? Yeah, featured prelim. Mm-hmm. Great fight. I mean, striker's delight. Cesar Almeida... Former Glory kickboxer, but he was like zero and two, I think, in Glory. Um, we, you know, he not not like a some great Glory kickboxer, but he has history. He went one and two with Alex Pereira back in way back, like before Pereira's Glory days, uh, back in twenty thirteen and twenty fifteen. Lost a trilogy to him. Um, yeah, really good striker. I mean, Brazilian kickboxing type fighter um, against Roman Kopalov, who's this Russian guy who kind of let us down when he came to the UFC. He had high expectations, was undefeated, knockout artist, lost the two, first two fights against very Uh-oh. mediocre fighters, and then just started putting it all together, hitting people to the body brutally, putting combinations together, getting head kick knockouts. Um, this is especially the, his body work that drew me to him. Um, but wrestling is still a flaw, but he won't have to face that here. In fact, he might want to do some offensive wrestling himself. Uh, because Cesar Almeida has, like, zero experience against it. He was getting taken down by Dylan Budka in his last fight before he started, like, just punching Budka from the bottom, basically, or from the clinch, and uh, just wearing him down and then knocked him out in the in the second I round. Will, it was a really pathetic give, ending, actually. To give Budka some credit, I've seen him wrestle well, and he is very strong. And to give He's Almeida some credit, he did keep himself safe and stuff most of the attempts yeah. and then knocked him out first thing in the second round as soon as yeah. he got the chance. I've also yeah. seen some clips this week of Almeida doing really nice work in the clinch, framing with elbows, yeah. being just, I think, uh, oh, Fano. Cooler Nelson. Yeah. Uh, Fano said it best. He said, uh, Cesar Almeida's best quality is realizing in MMA, the best way to succeed in the clinch is being downright fucking nasty in there. Yeah, and literally and shoving palms into faces, throwing elbows when he can, just throwing uppercuts, just making it nasty. So guys, that's why he won that close fight. It works. Yeah. He would just, he just shouldered Budka off and was like slamming the yeah. body when he could. He just did anything. He was just constantly punching while Budka was for a, for a not, kickboxer, was just trying to hold. Like, you know, a kickboxer, his close range work is exceptional. Like really yeah. good. Um, but yeah, Kapilov at range has been really, really good. Really good footwork in terms of playing yeah. lead foot battle with the Southpaw Orthodox matchup that he's dealt with in the past. He his boxing has looked good. And while the wrestling's not been great, going into the Hernandez fight, they showed a graphic on the screen that said he had defended twenty consecutive takedowns yeah. in the UFC. So, so it's weird. You know, he's getting better. He, like he's putting a lot at, of effort in there. If you look at his stats, it's really weird. Like he only got taken down the one time by Roberson, got choked out. Only got taken down the one time by Duraev. Actually, mostly got uh like I uh, just outstruck there, but also well, not mostly, partially, but also just got outstruck on the ground that one round. He lost really bad to Duraev. But then Dikirico, Punahele Soriano, Claudio Hibero, and Josh Fremd. It's good to not get taken down especially by that last guy who's actually a wrestler, but those first three guys not going to try to take mm. him down. But the thing that I am interested in is that he took down Punahele Soriano once. He even took down Duraev once. Went, uh, yeah, one for not, uh, one for two on, on Duraev and one for one on cop on Soriano. Um, those are th- make up three of his four takedown attempts in the UFC. I think he can take down Omeda here if, if Almeida starts getting to working him in the clinch, it might be unexpected by Almeida. Um, on, I mean, from like Almeida might not expect it, so it could be extra advantageous then. Yeah, I also just think, I don't know, I don't know. I, I, Almeida's older; he, he's thirty six. He's he's on the downward side of his career. Um, I like what Kapilov is doing. I pick him to win, but only by a hair. Like. Yeah, it, it should be a close fight. It should be a war. Yeah, I think this is going to be a banger. I'm actually taking Almeida. I think they, um, 
I think this might be one of those fights where they're pushing this guy to the title and they they see something in the tape, the matchmakers yeah. that we don't, and they're setting up Almeida for a knockout. I just get that feel. I don't know. Even though Kopalov is very good. Um, but uh, Almeida, like I said, downright fucking nasty with it. Um, he, uh, yeah, so I'm going to go Almeida KO, but I could very easily see Kopalov winning as well. Yeah. And, uh, you, and I'm 7 going, out of 10. I, I'm I like going 8 fight. out of 10. I'm, I'm going to go yeah. Almeida as well. I think... You know, should Kapalov be shooting, he's good enough at pulling guys up into an over-under and then, you know, as you said, downright fucking nasty in the clinch. Mm-hmm. And I think at range, it'll be pretty even. Um, I just don't think it's a great matchup for Kopalov. And I, while he does have good timing and decent drive on his takedowns, I don't think, you know, they're, they're very good altogether. And I think Almeida might piece him up. Uh, but yeah, I'll go, fuck it, 8 out of 10. Yeah, big boys banging. Yeah, it should be fun. All right. Now on. to a much worse boys. Almeida. We got big boys <laughs> banging, but in the derogatory way. <laughs> yeah, two guys who are grapplers that don't really know how to wrestle very well. Um, or to strike while grappling very well. Or, and Well, yeah. Romanov at least tries to strike. Tries or he's to. like com- the more comfortable one striking. Yeah. Almeida is front kick. Only against really bad guys. Though. Double knee. Yeah. Full disclosure, I think Almeida's going to win, but it's going to be me dog too. shit, sloppy, nasty, shitty, and it will make me weep because neither of these dudes Ugly. are fucking good wrestlers. And they're going to try to wrestle. I hate it. It brings me pain. Fucking basically, Yeah, basically, Romanov gasses before he can do anything to Almeida. That's my yeah, take and on he's, this fight. Yeah. He's not he's great at stopping fuck. a shot. He's yeah. horrible he's off got his a back, decent, too. Yeah, I don't even think he's Romanov's got a that top game. Top. That's it. That's all he has. I don't think he's, he's even he's that got good top on top. Game like he's fat as fuck. I yeah. think <laughs> he's just I think heavy. What I think is going to happen here is Jonathan's going to get uh, taken down, let himself get taken down, um, and just get into a good position to to sweep him pretty much instantly from half guard. Like the second they hit the mat uh, again. Yeah, we're talking about Almeida, who posts fight camp pictures in the gi for his MMA <laughs> fights. So there's a very good chance this guy's very adept off of his back and able to like he oh, yeah, to he find ab- a sweep. He, he and absolutely just, is. Yeah. So well, the the thing about Almeida that pisses me off the most is he's not really that good of a finishing threat. He doesn't strike no. and he gets him out. He only has a rear naked choke. He doesn't have any other submission offense. He doesn't have wrestling. He doesn't have striking. He, he, he seems knows how to come up on a single though. Terrifying. Hey, yeah. How poetic? He's got good how poetic returns. would it be though? Is if he forearm chokes Romanov after Romanov forearm choked Marcos Rogerio de Lima. I might kill myself. <laughs> that would be the funniest thing of all time right there. That would be the worst outcome for the sport as a whole because it just shows heavyweight is absolute dog shit. It is no, I think that's good shit. because that's that would just thing. Why is that a bad thing? Yeah, yeah exactly. this, we need everybody to realize this. Yeah. And Blue Checks on Twitter will you still want. be saying, he's so good. This is, this is a ranked fucking fight. Jesus Christ. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, so yeah, two out of 10, I'm going Almeida by what? I don't know. Something he'll figure it two out. Two out of 10. I'll made it by decision or late submission. Roman, I've gases. He'll probably yeah. get swept a bunch. If once he gets on top. Um, yeah. Again, when, yeah. I'm picking Roman off by running out of energy. Like that's yeah, how he's going to lose. <laughs> because of the gas tank. I mean, you're picking Roman off to lose by running. Out. Yeah. Um, yeah, because exactly. of the gas tank, I, the wrestling's like about even, like I can see after the first two or three minutes, uh, Jalton getting takedowns, and then I think he's way ahead on the grappling. Like, yeah, I think Romanov's going to get destabilized and swept real easy. Um, so, yeah, Jalton, three out of ten. Next, Sorry. we have actually good, an actually good grappling matchup. Grant Dawson, Joe Selecki, both very, very fun grapplers. Grant Dawson, I give the edge in terms of dynamism of his wrestling. Um, really good wrist control guy, really good uh, like riding guy, and phenomenal back control. But Selecki can scramble. He's not as good on bottom as he is on top. Uh, but it's a really exciting matchup. This, I think these guys are going to be throwing everything at each other in the grappling department, throwing up sweeps, submission attempts, looking for control. I just think... Grant Dawson has the edge just in having a little bit more of a refined game than Selecki might, but it could be a really fun matchup. I predict it will be. Again, we, uh, yeah. we've talked about this previously, um, but the process for Grant Dawson, the way he everything is yeah. patterned out and mapped out. He knows where he needs to go next from just about any position. And Joe Selecki's good, and I'm not saying he doesn't have a process. It's just 
you're forced into play a more flowing game against a guy who's going to yeah. know yeah, exactly I, where he's moving to after that. I and think it's he's again, more of a flow fighter than yeah. Dawson. Yeah. And it's a, well, it's a jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu versus wrestler type matchup. Yeah, you know, he doesn't have the great day. takedowns, so, so like he can't really initiate that as well against anyone good. He has to wait for them to initiate it and then grapple with them or you know get to the clinch and try to get on their back or something. And again, I just want to say how fucking weird that last Grand Dawson fight was. Like, getting caught like that. That was one of the most prime yeah. examples of a guy who just like got caught cold and lost his yeah. opportunity to fight you know i like yeah in no world in like a long five round fight that doesn't end in the first 30 seconds do i see bobby green like beating grant dawson but he did in that moment and that's the thing yeah, about mma i mean anybody can get caught at any moment but yeah I, shit I mean, happens it does i'm bobby really excited green to see doesn't have one punch power usually yeah, it's just exactly that that's and I've sport. seen Grant and Dawson get caught hard, much harder than yeah. that, and be yeah. totally fine. Well, he, um, yeah. he sort of just ran onto that one, and that was it. Yeah, you know? exactly. But I think <laughs> this fight. is a matchup. He's not going to get caught by Selecki at all. No, he's not gonna, at all. They're going to they're going to yeah. grapple. Everybody knows it. Um, and yeah, I think this is like Almeida Kovalev, but for the yeah the, the other way boys. around, the inverse. Yeah. yeah. If they do strike, though, what do you guys think? I mean, I think Dawson is also a bit better there. He's bigger. Bit- he's longer. I think Jeez. Selecki has decent power. Like the, uh, the way he throws his overhand, I think, I don't you know, think against so. a, a tried and true grappler in Dawson, I think it might be able to just be enough to get him shooting. I don't think either guy is a necessarily really gifted striker, um, I, with Dawson probably being the so slightly Selecki better. To me, has like rubber hands. Yeah, they don't do much, but I think he can sit down on shots enough to be like, you know, he's not knocking anyone out, but that's enough yeah. to be like, oh, I mean, that hurts. I don't want to do that like, again. I think that describes Grant Dawson more that sometimes he does that. Yeah, I have to they're, agree with that. They're very here. analogous fighters for one another. I think they both yeah. have very similar skills, but just, I think Dawson's just, just like he's, slightly better. Yeah, just like yeah. he's just missing a few things. He's missing the coherence to his game. That wrestling would just tie it all together. It's a nice little bow all the top, these guys you know, are... nice little red ribbon. Both these guys were excellent getting to the back and off the yeah. on the back, yeah. though. Like not exactly. on off their backs, but yeah, on no. somebody's back. So it should I'll be admit, interesting. I'm a huge fan see. of both of these guys. Yeah, yeah. It should be interesting to see when one of their backs is taken. How can they get out of you know being put in their signature move? Yeah, um, it's gonna but be a great I, fight. I expect I expect Dawson to win. This is circled Probably as my technical decision. nerd fight of the night uh, for sure. I'm gonna say yep. five out of ten. I'm gonna go seven out of ten. I love this fight, and I am. Also going to go Dawson by decision. I'm going to go Dawson by submission, actually. Ooh, I feel I like, like it. you know, with the kind of game yeah, he has on the that. back, the way that he can cook guys and control and everything is very almost formulaic. I think he's – because his hand trapping is really, really nice, the hand fight, um, mm-hmm. especially from the back. He does a really good job. And, you know, a guy like Selecki, who's a very good grappler himself, you're going to be fighting the hands a lot, and that takes a ton of energy out of you. The later it goes like that, I think the more likely it is that Dawson can find something. Great but, Dawson yeah, by seven slam. Out of 10. No, I'm just kidding. I, I don't know about <laughs> just that. Kidding. I mean, no, I'm just like he got knocked out in his last fight by slam. So. That's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> he won't be holding on to arm bars like he did yeah. last time, that's for sure. Even yeah. subconsciously. But um. So what number did you give? Seven out of ten. Seven. Okay. Also, he he gra- uh, Joe Selecki grappled Gregory Rodriguez back at the Fight yeah. Pass Invitational yeah. and drew with him, which is crazy. I feel like we mentioned that I mean, before, but still insane. Draws in I mean, FBI draws are just surviving yeah. the match and not getting subbed, but still, that's impressive. Gregory Rodriguez, that's way fucking <laughs> bigger than fucking him. Yeah. Yeah. He's huge. And the Jiu-Jitsu right. World Champion. Yeah. All right. Moving on to the next fight. I don't love this fight. I used to like Phil Rowe. Um, again, this is Jake Matthews, Phil Rowe. Sorry, introduction here. Um, <laughs> Phil Rowe here. is a uh, he's a um, he doesn't do much <laughs> when he gets in there. Um, his fight versus fucking uh, Neil Magny. Neil Magny. I was gonna say Jeff Neil, but I know that's not the right. Um, the other Neil. The other Neil in the division. Um, I mean that was just shit. Like, I mean he just got control he better in every he's way. Horribly, almost. Yeah, he's a horrible defensive lost. wrestler. Trains at Fusion XL, and he's kind of like, I don't know, I follow him on Instagram. He just talks a lot of shit in training and looks really good in the gym, and yeah. it does not translate to the um, to the map. But you want to talk about a guy who never really has translated to like long-term success is Jake, Jake the Celtic Matthews. Kid Matthews. Um, he is, I mean, outside of his win over Andre Fialho recently, who re- got knocked out again recently, which broke my heart. Um, 
he's looked kind of mid. He got outstruck well, pretty yeah. reasonably by Michael Morales in his last fight. Um, I mean, Morales is big and long, but yeah, you know, so like is Phil Rowe too. Yeah, Phil Rowe could outrange him if he wants to strike a range because, like, Phil Rowe's had good performances in the past. There's a reason yeah. I did like him. Like, he's he, when he gets to work with his straight punches, yeah, and knees and stuff, he's really dangerous. He's but, a killer athlete. Good sense of timing and rhythm. Yeah, but Just, like you look at his wins, yeah. Nico Price, old Jason, Jason and worst chin I've ever seen. Terrible, Ryan and then Orion Kosi mid from my hometown. Not very, you know, no he's a great guy, great guy, but he's no longer in not the UFC a top right now. level UFC fighter or anything. Yeah, no. uh, yeah, absolutely. Jake Matthews. I, don't really I mean, have much to say about this fight. He's other been than that. consistently the same guy for a long time, though. Twelve and seven in the UFC. Like Jake Matthews is a guy that came into the UFC young and didn't do what like Dustin or anyone did as far as coming in young. And, you know, like he's been around for 10 years since he was 19 when he entered the UFC. That's crazy. He's 29 now reaching his That's crazy. Know, he's only prime 29. as a fighter. Yeah. Um, but you know, we kind of already know what he is and it's hard to see him changing at any point soon. Um, but this is the sort of fight that could go either way for him. You know, he's going to beat down guys worse than him, like Fialio, like Darius flowers, uh, he's going to beat some guys around the, his level, like Li Jing Liang, yeah, um, Emil Weber Meek at the time. Uh, he has some decent wins on there, but every time he steps up, Kevin Lee, James Vick, Anthony Rocco Martin, Sean Brady, Michael Morales, he loses. So, I mean, he has a flowy boxing style. He can be quite good with it, but he's not great. His chin isn't great. He makes really dumb decisions at times. As far as especially wrestling decisions, like decisions either to wrestle or on how to wrestle, approach wrestling, offense or defense, uh, ends up on his back, you know, far more than he should based on his like actual skill set. I feel no like. urgency against Morales yeah. either. He was in a very like just... one speed striking battle and was getting outstruck the entire time and just yep. didn't do anything to change his fortunes. He seems Go to on, have Jesse. no process whatsoever. He's just a guy that like focused on fights. building a lot of skills and no emphasis on cohesion no way of putting anything together no sort of like tactical strategic advantages like he's just a guy that you know put all of his points into learning how to do things and never actually learning how to implement them if that makes sense That's yeah fair. all right i'm fair. over talking about this fight yeah i mean i don't know who's gonna win like like Phil Rowe go. could knock him out or even decision him if he gets his work rate up but i'll go row by decision I don't know. I think I might go Matthews by decision just because, like, I, I, I like picking against Phil Rowe just because he doesn't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but, but at, at some point, he's, but got, he's you, you would think he's going to learn. And can pot yes. shot well. Yeah, and Matthews is so streets, inconsistent. Six foot three. At some point, you'd think he's got to learn and at least up. The, like, he doesn't even have to have a high work rate. Right? Just a, like an average one would be good enough. But yeah. I don't know. He's man. got, he's know got, got good knees up the point. middle. Matthews yeah. doesn't move his head very much. I think he's got a chance. He's possible but, yeah. for sure. Three out of yeah. ten. Yeah, yeah three I'll, out of ten. I'll go f- by four. Whatever. Cool. Okay. Next one. Two guys that I'm actually very, very familiar with. Uh, Mickey Gall and Basil Hafez. Um, Basil Hafez. Very weird Sorry, matchup. Just, like, Just really yeah, weird because Mickey Gall I mean, been out of the UFC for two years. Um, Basil Hafez, guy who just got into the UFC, has been fighting professionally since 2012. Or not wow. professionally. Been fighting amateur yeah. 2012, okay. went pro like pro 2000... in 2016. Yeah. But it's still um, only 8 4 and 1 currently. Crazy. Yeah. And he fun took fact, several years. Or I guess he didn't take years off. He only took 2019 is the only year I can see he took off. Fun fact Hafez has fought and prepared for, I think, four guys from Gaul's gym. And uh, the ones huh. that made it to the fight, he won. So there are two gyms that are very, very familiar with one another. Interesting. Um, Hafez is a decent wrestler. Like I think he can bang. He's he's not you know a technician standing. He's got power. The hell is that? Jordan Levitt oh, in a wrestling yeah. singlet. <laughs> oh, that's that's awesome. Yeah. Um, Hafez has decent power. Not much in terms of like technical depth or anything like that. Gall is a guy who can't wrestle very well. He's got a head outside single. He's Carrier got a show. knee tap. He's got a drop to the knees double leg that he can at least drive into once he hey his blast you know, double on enters. cm punk was one of the cleanest takedowns i've ever seen <laughs> yeah. in my life <laughs> yeah um, I hit a blast double on cm punk for sure 
Mickey Gall on his back because he's not a great wrestler. Hafez is not a great wrestler either, but he he's good, like solid. He can, he, he's he's a, like a high school level wrestler. He's just got yeah. a good amount of power and athleticism on him that he. But can, he has some wrestling base, whereas Mickey Gall yeah. has like an MMA base. Yeah. Uh, Mickey off his back is not a guy who's like throwing up a lot of submissions. He's not a super active guard player, but he can hit some really nice sweeps. Like as we saw against um, rude boy, Randy Brown, he hit a really nice sweep in the second round of that one. Mm. Um, And Mickey Gall is actually deceptively good on the feet. I want to say he's, I mean, he's not good. He's, he's he's, not awful. Like not as awful as, well, he transitioned to thinking because he went down to kill cliff. So he's, you know, at some point towards like permanently, yeah, he moved down to Florida and everything. He kind of convinced himself he was like a decent striker or a much more competent striker than yeah. he really is on paper, and started being like an out fighting, like at range kickboxing matches with Mike Malott that ended poorly, and yeah. against Alex Morono. So he's but is he, he still down there though? Yeah, he's down he in Florida full time. Think that, and um, I think. In the, I, I hope at least in the time away he's realized that you know the best part of his offense was transitional in the clinch. He was able to hurt guys pretty well. He, you know, against Sage Northcutt he had that uh, little standing mirror lock rip in the overhook into the overhand. Um, against yeah. Jordan Williams he, you know, threw up the stone wall, caught a collar tie, banged a right hook, dropped him, and then entered them on takedown. Stuff like that can work really well for him, and that's like actually a pretty intelligent game. Yeah, uh, it's just you know if he can you know realize that that's my path to victory, I think he's got all the tools to beat Hafez. At yeah. the same time, if he doesn't put those things together, I think Hafez has a really good chance of just you know either getting him down, keeping him down, winning a tepid decision, or, or potentially even banging him, him out. Yeah, yeah, he's got power. Mickey Gall's chin has been a weak spot at times, and uh, yeah, Basil Hafez he only has one knockout, but it was his last win. So and it was I feel a like he's one of those knockout, it was, shifting it was a beautiful hook. right hand. I think he's one of those guys who like had a wrestling base and then didn't really know how to like use his hands and then he just suddenly got it and now he can actually throw like he was he was losing badly on the feet to Jack Della Maddalena, but he was there with him at least. Game. That's not an easy guy to hang with. Very much game. Yeah. He had a very he had a right hand that could find the target. Like you just need some kind of natural yeah. accuracy, cleanliness. He's not mechanically right super hand. sound. No, but he's getting better. And he has good eyes. He can, you know, yeah, time exactly. an opening. And, um, and he's tough as hell. So, I don't know. I think yeah. this is a really bad fight for Mickey Gall. I, I like Basile Hafez by knockout here probably. Um, I do as well. second round. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, he should be, he's, he go should Gall be a fun, solid guy who can hang around the UFC. Yeah. I am enough. biased, I will say. Yeah. Um, Mickey Gall is a super solid dude. He is a uh, new Jersey boy. Well, he actually... I don't know if I should say this, but he's helped me out financially when I was like mm-hmm. broke as shit, really yeah. trying to make it in this sport. In so MMA, yeah. always going to ride for the dude. Yeah. Fucking Hell yeah. One of a kind. Great guy. Um, yeah. I'll go five out of 10. It's a perfectly average fight. I'll Fair. go four out of 10. I'll go four out of 10 as well. I mean, it's a okay. regional level fight yeah. on the UFC undercard, but it's the early prelims. That's, you know, yeah. it's fair. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, okay, it's so not boring, uh, completely boring at least. This next fight, I'm not going to talk anything technically. I just strictly want to set up some backup for, or some background for this fight because okay. I don't know if you guys know this. But Eileen Perez versus Jocelyn Edwards. I don't know if you remember last fight Eileen Perez had a couple months ago. She had a black eye in the press conference and going into the fight. Everybody was like, weird, uh-huh. was she sparring the week of or something? Turns out, this was released by MMA Junkie yesterday. Um, they got in a fight at the PI, Eileen Perez oh. and Jocelyn Edwards. Jocelyn Edwards, or Eileen Perez tweeted something about Jocelyn Edwards' last fight, how she sucked and something. So Jocelyn Edwards got mad and confronted her. Don't know how it went from there, but it resulted in Eileen Perez's male coach choking Jocelyn Edwards unconscious. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, so there's like some serious, serious bad blood. They were both supposed to get cut from the UFC after that. I don't know what or why they chose not to, but... um. Yeah, so I don't think either of these fighters are very good. I'm not interested in that, but no. I am interested in the bad blood <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, the violence sure. that might ensue. So I mean, I think Eileen Perez isn't totally, totally terrible. Like she can wrestle a little bit. She she has some things going on that what, are. Do you okay. subscribe to her OnlyFans or something? No, no like, I'm just kidding. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, for, that was a bad taste. Relative comment. to the division, she's yeah. not terrible. 
That's the worst division in the sport, but relative to the division, she's not terrible. The um, division is terrible. Win. Yeah, it is. And, and Jocelyn she's Edwards is okay terrible. for it. Jocelyn Edwards is terrible. Yeah, like really, really, truly terrible. So I, I think well, I'm going Jocelyn Edwards by wins. revenge. Are blatant robberies, also it's by true. the way. Well, I'm going Jocelyn Edwards she, by revenge, missed, however that may be. And she missed weight in both of them. <laughs> Sick. Missing weight and then robbing your opponent, like missing weight yeah. in the worst division coming, too. Yeah, her come up is coming. Yeah, yeah, and she's not even that big, like of a. She's no. Not, yeah, she's not even that big. At she's just weight. not disciplined. Yeah. Okay. All right, yeah, well, I'm going Eileen Perez' decision, and we can move on from that and go to the first fight, who was, has one of my favorite fighters on the card, Andre Lima. I really like this guy. Probably the like guy on the prelims, I'm like most like, this is my guy, you know? He was supposed Remember to be fighting my favorite fighter, Neom Dragal Tunan Demborel. Yeah, which would have the, been legendary for Bruce. That was pronounce. that was impressive pronunciation. Oh, I've said that so many times. Tunan That's my favorite name. It was my favorite to hear Bruce Buffer pronounce also, but alas, mm-hmm. he... His day will have, come. Did he get... What happened? He got sick? Yeah, I'm not really sure. Yeah, he withdrew it, said. Okay. Anyway, yeah. Um, against Mitch Raposo, <laughs> uh, who, guy that was on the Ultimate Fighter season of, like, Volk versus Ortega. Um, decent. Lost to Ludwig Shalinian and then Jake Hadley on the Contender Series. So, didn't make it to the UFC. Went away. Won four fights across the regional promotions, and this is his his uh, first real UFC fight. He was so, scheduled to be on do. the Contender Series in about yeah. two months as well, Against and Jack I got Duffy, pulled from that they, fight. Yeah, he got I will pulled from say that fight to come here to do this. I actually really like Mitch Raposo. Yeah, mm-hmm. he's scrappy, but he's um, he's a weird fighter. He's like his stance is kind of very narrow, very like straight, but he like. You know, one foot is almost directly on a line in front of the other, but he keeps his torso completely squared. It looks really wonky, and he's, like, leaning all the way forward. But he does some good stuff. He can wrestle yeah. well. Uh, he can bang. Like, he's got good power. Mm, he hits too. the body. He throws in combination. He mixes up his timing. Um, and the one thing, Lima does not have very good takedown defense. No, I he think can this, scramble like a demon. He can. But I think, yeah. you know... If we're in sort of like the next phase of MMA, you're getting guys that can punish the get-ups. I think yeah, that might be – and sure. Mitch Raposo is a guy who is pretty decent at that in his yeah. last couple. You know, who was He's it? a young guy, uh, guy who's got to be getting better consistently. But, yeah, I, I mean, I think Lima is a great striker. Uh, I think him versus Severino is going on to going to be like one of the best fights of the year if it didn't get stopped. Like it was, it was, I mean, of the year so far, like it was on track to be like a top 10 fight of the year in the UFC so far because – they were both scrambling with each other so well, striking with each other. It was really violent, and then just halfway through it, he bites him, and the fight gets stopped. Uh, in a fight I, that I, I w- I Severino that fight. was probably winning, which is just he insane. He was probably to me. winning, but but Lima was like in the ascendancy. He was like, I think ah, starting I know to put a stop to his biting in it. round yeah. two. <laughs> yeah, it was really <laughs> close the whole way through. It was really close the whole way through. Yeah, I just think I think Lima was in the ascendancy. I think he's a good striker, a really punishing striker for flyweight, um, mm-hmm. and. I don't think Mitch's grappling is that that good. But again, you know, he's had a lot of time. Things can be different now. He just won the um, Cage Titans Flyweight Championship, also, by the way. Yeah, I just want to do point out that he's fighting in New England, which is one of the weakest regional areas in the United States in talent and matchmaking. They're notorious for poor, like, really set up matchmaking. So he's fought a 4-2 guy and a 2-0 and guy in his last two fights. And yeah. Cage Titans, I love Cage Titans, as we all do. But they, uh, you look up and down their cards, there's some, there's some mismatches a lot of times on those. Yeah, They like to set up the guys they want to set up. So see Joe Giannetti. For, okay, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I, I, think, I think Lima is genuinely uh, a talent with some some future potential so i'm going with for him by probably clean decision maybe tko probably decision oh yeah. and um and seven out of ten it's a good opening flyweight fight uh i'm the flyweight opening fight guy so seven out of ten yeah the flyweight enjoyer yeah specifically on oh, opening fights for guys we've pretty much never heard of that no one's ever heard of just those fights always bangers yep i'm gonna go seven out of ten i'm gonna go lima I think his level of competition is much better than Raposo, and that's going to be the deciding factor here. Yeah. 
I'll go seven out of ten, and I'm gonna take Raposo by decision, even though it I'm not confident on it. I just think uh, it's a winnable fight for him. What's that do us for the card as a whole? Shit, I missed one. Which one? I don't know. <laughs> I missed. Oh wait, I, we, we did an automatic zero for Eileen Perez versus Jocelyn Perez. That's why I missed it. Yes, because we didn't. Oh no, I think we it. should do some beef value there. No, I'll go one. Anyway, we didn't. We didn't. We already skipped it and didn't give our predictions. So it's a fight. Zero there. It is a fight. Okay, our results. Does anyone remember what they said? They're, they predicted. You predicted a seven. seven. I said five point five. I think. And I said six point five. It's a six point eight on the on the fido meter. So right between me and Dylan. Pretty, pretty good job there, but not bad. What did I just say? But but right. but all right. Well, I we'll play. I tried to I'll say bra time. and buddy. So I said, bah. <laughs> blah, blah, so blah. Okay. Yeah. 6.8. I mean, yeah, it's a fine, like, like I said, it's a fine pay-per-view. It is underwhelming because of the lack of like big fights uh, after the, like the first two or not even big fights, just relevant fights, divisionally really relevant fights. That's the big issue. Not contenders. much relevance on this card. Yeah. 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 IE contenders, but well, it just feels very thrown together throughout with fighters. We enjoy. Yeah. And a lot of them are like, but you know, there's still enjoyable fights here and, and fun to be had. Like, they brought Blood Mickey Gall back shed. after two years away just to yeah. throw a local guy on the card. Yeah, you know? pretty much. Pretty much. It, it feels but, like um, a very slapdash kind of card that Yeah, I mean, it's, it's Dustin very... Poirier versus Islam Makachev in Newark. In like, Newark, New Jersey. <laughs> it is a weird, like, location for that very Not reason. even New York. Yeah, New York. Hey, 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 second hey one watch yourself. Play. <laughs> yeah, you said, where, I thought the Jersey Boy was coming out. You were going to be way more New Jersey on this episode. You said you th- threatened. I was. I'm a stuff. little disappointed. I, hey, too. hey, you want to do hey. it? You do it. Hey, uh, it's too little, too late. Okay, Mr. well, listen, I, out, I will boys. say the accent only comes out when I'm really agitated or we're really drunk, um, hyped up. What? What? <laughs> Never. All right. Now that right. about does us. Uh, next Peace week, out. USC Louisville, pretty fun card. Yep. Um. Yeah, catch us on Twitter at CageCraftPod. And check out the video version if you want to see our beautiful, beautiful mustaches. YouTubes. Yeah.